about 20 percent. We've already had 200,000 students, two to 300,000 students from India take classes. And this is your industry. <laughs> Interesting, great question, great question. Another engaged, the same engaged student. Where is China? It's not there. There are two reasons. Language, and there's another reason. The great I'm sorry? The Great Firewall. The Great Firewall, the block YouTube. Um, so we're finding a way. Tsinghua University just signed on. The Chinese are very, sm they're moving very fast on this. And they're actually, they will likely break the Great Firewall just to enable this. The proxy, we're doing all sorts of things. You can have a proxy of all sorts of things we're working on right now. This is, remember, we're only 18 months into this. So we're just beginning to figure all that out. One, what are the implications for education policy makers? I mean, uh -huh. so there are very significant economies of scale that are clearly evident here. Yeah. Now, does this mean that we, as we don't need to make local investments because now we have all this available coming in from MIT and Harvard and all of that? I mean, so as a in terms of you know resources, should countries like India perhaps be shifting how where we spend our money and how we spend our money? I think we should be spending more money, but I'd be spending it differently. Okay. Um, I, here's how I would do it. Um, I I'm a professor at MIT. I might not use my MIT professor's lectures. I may use something from IIT Kanpur, or from Stanford or Berkeley. Why? Because I want to flip the classroom. It becomes a tool, a friend, not an enemy so that I individually work with students to add value, right? Uh, the whole principle of, I'm going back to MIT now, the whole principle of MIT is learning by doing. And we're finding that we're doing less and less doing because we're spending more and more time in lectures. So if you look at it that way, uh, frankly in India my concern is that a lot of our students are very theoretical. They don't have hands on, they don't you know, apply their knowledge. I would suggest that this changes the paradigm but one-on-one -on -one tutoring, not, in the, not like IIT tutoring, but in the regular format, um, I feel is what our students need, number one. Number two, my personal view, and I've been talking to the Ministry of Education about this, is that we can also create more well-rounded students who have a sense of ethics, who have a sense of purpose, a sense of, you know, of uh, the greater good. Um, so, you can look at it as you're trying to get rid of jobs. I don't think you're suggesting that. Or you can look at it as a new tool which enables a whole new type of teaching. And that's how MIT is looking at it. I thought uh, yeah. one of the ways in which uh, this can be brought more effective in places like India, so many students register, is if you read if the professors who are putting up their courses like this, if they read a workshop for creating teaching assistants, let's say for India. And we need from various parts, let's say class of 40, they come there and they go through this workshop or a, or a, a little course. I think then the effectiveness can be far greater. Absolutely. And the impact will be far greater here because they will buy this and they will interpret this for the students and they will provide that one on one interface Absolutely. wherever it is required. Because the levels can be very different. Also. Absolutely. And so, in fact, this summer, we taught our first, what I call, a meta MOOC. A MOOC pointed at teachers, right? And uh, we're in discussions now to create workshops to do precisely what you're talking about. So absolutely agree. Uh, this is like a pyramid, right? The higher you go, the more you can scale. Yeah. So you can create a movement. And we are acutely aware of that. And we just ran our first one this summer. It's called 8.MREV. It's a physics class. It is taught by Professor David Pritchard an MIT physicist whose five of whose students and people he's mentored received Nobel Prizes. And he taught this class because he's passionate about education. And it's, it's already, it's, if you go to edX.org, it is running right now. Okay, so uh, we can uh, sort of uh, sponsor teachers from here? This right now, so we're doing it in two stages. First is a MOOC pointed not at a massive open online course, not at students, but at professors, how to teach physics. The second, which we haven't done, which we are planning right now, is a workshop. But it's still in planning stages, so I can't give you a date. It's a physical workshop. But you're going to do that? Absolutely, that will yeah. happen.
Uh, for the Khan Academy, yep. is it very similar to this? Uh, yes. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Salman Khan is someone, um, he's of uh, half Indian, half Bangladesh, South Asian extract. He's an MIT grad. He has three degrees from MIT. Uh, we should all be very proud of him. He gave up a very lucrative career in the hedge fund industry because he's tutoring his uh, niece. And he has now shot thousands of videos. And he's an extraordinary guy. Okay. This is. Uh, what Salman Khan showed us was short informal videos are more effective than this. And so this is similar. I've spoken to him. We talk a lot. And so he's working with us, but informally. We are different entities, uh, but he, it's kind of parallel. right? He's more focused on high school. We're more focused on college. Uh, so there's some differences as well, but the very similar concept. And also, he doesn't have automatic grading. That's a technical breakthrough. He's just starting that, and we're helping him with that. So picking up from the work at uh, kind of the lifelong kindergarten lab at MIT yeah. Media Lab, so does this thing now enable, let's say, Indian professors or lecturers or tutors to allow their students to be yes. more involved in tinkering and this be taken care of online? So lifelong kindergarten is a, a group headed up by MIT by someone called Mitch Resnick. Mitch Resnick and Lifelong Kindergarten created two systems that are used worldwide. One is Lego Mindstorm, with which you can make robots. It's a very big movement now. And the other is called Scratch, which is a programming language that I taught to my daughter when she was six years old. Okay. So Mitch was on a task force that I appointed that looked at how to create tinkering kits. So the idea is you can get the online stuff, but then can you buy a kit? that students can use to do things with. So we're actually likely going to launch a kitting approach that is tied to a MOOC uh, in January of next year. Not this fall, but spring. So we're heading in that direction. Could this actually be one of the answers to this Salim's question? In our investment in our policy, we can go this way. We kind of offload one part of our responsibility. That's exactly right. So, so coming back to that, to, to your question, what it will do is, uh, that's exactly right. One is train teachers to be mentors and you know, do hands-on learning. And the other is uh, create fab labs, create kits, create hands-on activities, and so on. I really believe that's in the in field activities. Right? I really believe that's the direction in which education goes a whole. And India has a great opportunity to take, take a leap, especially because we are undergoing change now. And you might as well change in a direction that the world is going in. Right? Yeah. My feeling is that, taking from where I could left, there could be a reverse uh, swing in terms of Indian professors teaching courses becoming more popular in the US for the simple reason, one, that our economies are of great interest to them. The whole world actually is talking about the economies, where the future growth is likely to be, no matter what we are doing with it. Secondly, that the kind of ground experience that one can bring in, possibly of the kind that people are interested in today about affordability, about frugality, and so on, will be perhaps come out much more richer, much more variety, much more diverse way in our classes. So why should we not think about looking at it as an opportunity yeah, for us to score a massive following around the world, which journals and their politics may not have allowed too much. You see, their citation politics and all of that is very best and bound or at least biased. Whereas in a class, it is entirely what students feel about it. There is no other barrier. If you are teaching well, and if students are attending it and enjoying it, nobody can prevent them. So those numbers will be out. Every day after their class, you know how many students attended from where and so on. This kind of statistics comes online automatically. So then you know. So basically, uh, there is no reason why uh, anyone from any country can't play offense here. And just be, a, you know, why, do we, why does India have to be a consumer? I'm Indian, I'm going to teach a class. Anand is Indian. I mean, we're the same blood, you know. So, I mean, it's the same with Africa or Europe. There's no, this is a great equalizer. That's my point, right? Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to take this conversation further. I am sure you've heard of something called NP10 yes. as well, which, has, which is yeah. an Indian uh, equivalent of this. Now, uh, there are professors, for example, V. Balakrishnan of IIT Madras, who's a million hit. Uh, professor in the sense and most of the viewers there are from across the world so that is already happening although we really need to go uh, you know big scale into this MOOCs kind of thing but the second part of it is is there any country uh, taking forward the point the policy aspect that was mentioned here is there any country where this has really been the MOOCs 
we, and again, going back to the Washington Accord, where we're, we're really looking at credit transfer and student mobility, has anybody actually structured it into the scaffolding that they have for credits and said that, well, like you said, you could pick up, it's a brand buffet, a course from here and there, but you did, let's say, eight courses out of ten in your face-to-face -face brick and mortar university, and you picked up two or three from somewhere else and subsumed it into what was required for you to get a degree. Has that been structured anywhere? Because we've seen the thinking of it here, and we'd like to learn from people who've done that. Yeah, that's a great question. So the first question, NPTEL, I'm a huge fan of. I should tell you that I've uh, used NPTEL myself. So if I need to learn about some topic, batteries, if you do a search on the internet, it goes to NPTEL. And I've used it a lot. Um, the, I think the one, you know, as with any technology, you develop it given the state now, right? And then things move on. But I think NPTEL can be adapted very quickly. And so we're very excited that IIT Bombay has come on board. Um, and we're hoping that more IITs will come on board. And we're hoping that uh, NPTEL can be leveraged in this way. So I, I'm a huge fan of NPTEL. The only challenge with NPTEL is it's uh, long lectures. Um, and that self-selects people who have a certain uh, stamina. OK. Uh, in terms of the credit exchange, um, very beginning stages. There are deep discussions about this. There was a bill, pa a bill that is in play right now in California that requires any credit offered through a MOOC to be accepted by any college in California. I should be celebrating. I think it's a bad idea right now because there are too many unknowns. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, you know, period. I'm just saying right now we don't know enough to pass a bill like that. We should just think it through. But I think it's inevitable. We also have some interesting things happening in Wisconsin and Canada. Are we doing it with the Washington Accord going worldwide? I think we're about six months to a year away before we have enough data to have those conversations in, a, in an informed way. But there's a lot of speculation about it. Right. Excuse me. OK. Uh, oh. So sorry, there's a question yeah, back right. there. Yeah. No, it's not a question. I'm just I'm speaking to make sure that uh, I have understood the gist of what you have spoken. Uh, you were telling about the need to develop a new technology model and a new business model of academics which does not compromise the uh, interests of academics as we understand. I suppose the emphasis is on giving individual opportunity to learn all by himself rather than sitting in a classroom. Because um, see, I'm a lecturer. I give lectures sometimes three hours, generally three hours, and five hours sometimes, two, three days. Uh, it's a different atmosphere, and it's a different, uh, I mean, uh, give in and take, totally different. Whereas what you're saying is that, uh, you know, give the individual a chance to learn all by himself and make a business model of that, uh, that type of, for, for academics. I suppose this is the gist of what we are speaking. About. I would put it differently, but along those yeah. lines. I would say that, uh, Give an individual the chance to learn by himself or herself. Right, right. That's fine. But I didn't say business model. I mean, business model is a whole other discussion. I'm saying change the classroom. I'm not, it's not black and white. You can still do a lecture in the classroom. So, for example, you can take a pulse in the classroom and say, listen, did everyone get, I, you know, I looked at the results. Everyone messed up this one question. Can I clarify that for you? You can still do that, right? But it's not five hours or one hour. I, yeah. yeah right. okay. But yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, as I say, uh, online courses like the uh, ones which are offered by MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and its implications for Indian higher education, there's a whole lot of intermediaries which will have to come in, which will have to be trained, which will have to be, uh, which will have to adapt to this. Because the levels of the courses that are being offered by you or Stanford may not may be too high for many of the students here. Yeah. So there there is a need for an intermediary. There is just for to interpret this. There is a need for an intermediary to cast it in the Indian context. In some cases, there is a need for an intermediary who will also assist in grading. So there is a whole host of a whole host of intermediaries who will have to be trained and exposed to this, and then they will have to build on the basic platform the courses which would be very relevant and which can be delivered with effective results. So th I think that is where the role of MIT and others will be to how to sort of train these intermediaries, how to induct them, 
that I think is a very important thing for the Indian context. Right. Well, I'll turn the, uh, you know, Kennedy said, ask not what uh, the country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. So let me use that quote and say, uh, I'm here as, as an Indian. I'm not here to, I'm, I'm sharing an opportunity with you, right? MIT has already uh, invested $30 million into it. There are, I have 80 people working for me now developing this. So I don't think I can go back to MIT and say, hey, we should do this, you know, because I've already taken on a huge burden. What MIT is really looking for right now is partners to take great ideas and make them real. And we're very excited that IIT Bombay has come on board. But your point is very well taken, which is we need an ecosystem. And the ecosystem will provide some of these services. Also, while MIT does edu want to educate the rest of the world, it's an American university. And you know, it's a $2 billion budget, research budget. Much of, much of it comes from the US government. So its focus is on the US government. And in the US, uh, on US, uh, sorry, uh, population. In the US, uh, in fact, a lot of that is happening. So right now, we have a proposal to work with community colleges, two-year colleges. And um, what we've done is taken a w MIT level one semester class, right? Teach it over two semesters. Mm -hmm. So in easier bite-sized chunks. And then um, we brought their professors in. And we, you know, it's not their professors are bright people. Just, you know, here's how we taught it. Here's, here's what works. Here's do what doesn't. Just give them some tidbits. And then the professors have gone back and taught it in a 2x, you know, two times time. And they've developed some learnings. So the ecosystem is forming. Gen you know, the, question, the picture I showed you of those Mongolian students, there were two older people sitting there. The Mongolians found local professors to mentor them. Right? So what I mean is that there's only so much MIT can do, right? I'm here to say, you know, back in the country of my birth, I'm saying, look, folks, this is exciting. Let's get involved because our students already are, right? And I think what you're talking about will happen and needs to happen. Ma'am. Uh, I'm interested in that uh, MOOCs which you said, which is pointing at the teachers. Yeah. Uh, one model, uh, I don't know, you might be already having it, is why should uh, the teachers in India, I, I'm talking about tier three colleges, uh, which is a yeah. huge number in this country. Uh, if the teachers uh, will start learning from scratch, instead of that, if there are video lectures of how MIT is using MOOCs in their own class, and then they can go back and reinvent exactly. and do things, stuff on their own. But it would bring them a step higher up then rather than learning or uh, trying to find out very quickly what they can do with MOOCs and how they can bring it out in class. Yeah. It's so like shadowing the yeah. US professor or something like that. So that's all, th that's all planned. All that is planned. Our first year, we build the software, we build the, develop 30 classes, put them online, build the platform, brought in 30 partners, right? That's what we achieved in the first year. So we're just entering year two. We've launched one MOOC on how to teach physics. The next one will be like what you're talking about, which is here's how we do it. And by the way, I, I just want to say that the, one of the great things is in this world, we're not convinced that we have all the answers, right? So we're just saying this is how we're doing it. And if you have input, let us know. In fact, at MIT, I lead a task force called the future of MIT. The treasurer of MIT and I lead it. And we're looking at how MIT will reshape itself in the next five years. That uh, task force, we have a web website. It's called future.mit.edu. And it's open to anyone in the world. Future.mit.edu. You can go there. And you can't, only MIT community can comment because we don't want, you know, we want to control that. But anyone can see it. So, yeah, we're very open to sharing. And we'll do some of the things you're talking about. Right? So, if I may, how, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we can because I, you know, I'm frankly this is my last slide, so we can just go into discussion. Yeah, uh, I'm the faculty. Yeah. Uh, I'm the faculty at uh, Institute of uh, Information and Communication Technology. Uh, I mean, I want to teach the course, uh, uh, you know, from your platform. So, what are the criteria uh, by which uh, you know any institute uh, can join in and uh, start the course? So, um, we are um, in our first phase. We wanted to add about 30 universities. We're almost there. And as you might imagine, there's a lot of pressure from universities that want to join the consortium. Uh, and I would say that the first phase, we're pretty much maxed out. So we won't be 
putting more professors in the consortium in the first phase um, easily. I mean, there might be some pressure. There might be one or two, but we're done. Um, and these are MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, Texas, uh, TU, Delft, Tsinghua, IIT Bombay, you know, really good schools. Um, we only build relationships with, with universities because this is meant to be a, an academic consortium. It's not, indiv you know, an individual just can't put a course. There are other for-profit companies that are doing that, but we aren't taking that approach. We want to build relationships with institutions. But the software was open sourced Janu June 1. So there is no reason why you can't download it.